Okay. Okay, Cam, are you going to introduce our um, next guest? Our first guest, I yes, guess. Yes, we are. Oh, yes, our first guest. So i um, very excited to be um, introducing Dr. LaWanda Hill um, for your first workshop. That's who you'll hear from. And she's going to be talking about the importance of taking care of yourself and your community unapologetically. So as a reminder, we welcome questions. So use the Q&A in, in the chat box. And if time allows, we will read them. And we're going to get ready to welcome Dr. LaWanda Hill. Hey, y'all. Hey, listen, it is so many historically black colleges and universities in this space. I am so excited. Y'all took me back to the yard. You know, I'm not that too many years removed from the yard. I got to admit, I still got like an ear to the street. So I am so excited to see all of these amazing campuses, you know, represented in this space. But, you know, I'm a little biased. So shout out to the Southern University school system. I know y'all are in the okay. space. I've seen some representatives from Shreveport. I, I don't see anyone from Baton Rouge because I hail from the Southern University in a &M College, straight out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. Born in France. So I love to see all of the this energy and this space, um, you all taking up space. So happy Tuesday. I'm so excited to be with you all. My name is Dr. LaWanda Hill. I'm a licensed psychologist. I am a consultant. I am a curator of spaces that center mental health and well-being for Black folks. So I really want to just pause. Um, and yes, I got some SU Angelica in this space. I knew we was there. I knew we was there. We may just be like hanging out in the background, but I I knew where we in the space we were in the space so i want to take a moment you know just to really invite you all to really understand the importance of this point in time so you know as an hbcu grad i was a, psych a student of psychology obviously I'm a, I'm a psychologist now but at this point in time when i was matriculating through my undergrad experience mental health was still taboo even as a student of psychology um, mental health, well-being was still very taboo. I mean, we knew we wanted to enter into this space and create room, which is what you all are benefiting from today, but it was not front and center. And most certainly, self-care was not a topic. Community care probably was like an underlying current because we we are all we have always been a collectivist um, community. But for you all to be able to participate in an, an unapologetically free conference that is centering the mental health and well-being on black campuses is amazing. So I just want you to take a moment and just celebrate that, you know, and give like a, a heart. Uh, a thumbs up in the chat to really understand that this fruit of this labor has been, you know, ongoing. So give a moment and clap for yourselves because you are the recipients um, of labor that has been going on for a while and you will subsequently benefit because you are taking, you have the permission, you have the space to really be able to sit down and center your mental health and well-being. So I just want to acknowledge that before we go any further, because I think it's important to really capture the moment and what you're stepping into. And you all are stepping into a very important time. So hopefully you, I'm going to ask you all to engage me um, we're going to be talking about self-care and community care today. Um, I need you to engage me in the chat. I need you to make me feel like you're right there with me. I need you to answer some of the questions. I need you to even push back, you know, like, oh, Dr. Hill, I'm going to that, you know, or be curious because I have a lot of resources that I do believe will help you um, and center your mental health and well-being, but I want it to be a collaborative experience between the both of us. OK, so with that said, let's talk about how we are going to spend our time today. Let me see. Why are my slides not moving? OK, there we go. All right. So our goals today are very simple, but they have very great value. I'm going to ask for you to engage me in the chat. I'm going to ask for you to participate because what I'm going to teach today, what I'm going to ask for you to do in the chat today is really what I'm trying to teach today. I'm really trying to help you understand the importance of relationships, of engaging in relationships and being able to take ownership of that because I fundamentally believe it is a part of mental health. 
So our goals today are threefold. We're going to explore our traditional definitions of self-care. Like, what is that? What is self-care? What comes up for you? Like I said, when I was matriculating through undergrad at the Southern University and A&M College, self-care was not even, can you think about that just for a moment? Self-care was not even a part of the conversation. There was no thoughts of mental health and well-being being centered. And by centered, I mean having a space for us to be able to take up time, to be able to truly fundamentally pursue it. So it's new. You know, it's new for a lot of people. And so I really want to just kind of get a pulse. What is your definition of self-care? What does it entail? Right. I want to discuss the importance of community and how it helps us in our journey of self-care. Self-care usually thinks about individuals. What are we doing to take care of ourselves? But I believe I'm going to offer you a different definition that self-care definitely involves community with other people. And to guess what? To be in community with other people, it takes work. It takes skills. It takes intentionality. So we have to really cultivate those skills and resources. I was listening to the intro of, you know, the research that went out, you know, to all these different college campuses and asking you all, what is it that you were looking for and you want resources and you want tools? Well, to be in community and to be in relationship with people in honor of your self-care will really require a different set of tools and skills that I'm going to introduce to you today. And then we're going to assess if we have a thriving community in the world of social media, where we have abundant and unprecedented. I'm going to use that word because that was used earlier. We have unprecedented access to people, yet we remain not connected and we remain isolated and not in community of other people. I really want to assess are we in a thriving community? And if we're not, how are we going to pivot to make that happen? OK, so again, our goals simple today, but they have a lot of depth. They have a lot of meaning. I'm going to ask you to engage me and follow me along this journey. All right. So first things first. Double click. Let's define self-care. Drop it for me in the chat. When we talk about self-care you have a lot of access to what this may mean. A lot of different definitions floating out there about what this would mean. So when we talk about self-care, I want you to help me understand a few questions that come to mind that I want you to kind of drop in the chat. You don't have to ask, answer all of them, but I hope that you one of them will resonate with you and you'll begin to drop it in the, the chat. So let's define self-care. What comes to mind when you think of self-care? How many people in your friendship circle are talking about self-care? Or is this something new? Is this something that like Dr. Hill, I just pulled up at this conference and all of a sudden y'all was talking about self-care. That's cool too. Let us know what is your definition of self-care? How many people in your friendship circle are talking about it? Okay, I'm going to come back to the chats in a few seconds. I love it. I see it, Khalil. I'm going to circle back to you. Is it something you've heard your family discuss? Let's talk about that. Self-care. Is that something that you all were talking about in your family? Is that something that you've heard about at your college, at your university, in your friendship circles, on online? Okay. How do you define self-care? Is it, does it even resonate with you? Right? Let's be honest. Like, are you kind of like, eh, self-care, don't really know about what that means? Right. What does it mean? So some of the things I'm seeing self-care is any act that you do for yourself that makes you feel better. Mental health days, mental health days, loving it. Doing things to relax your mind, relax your body, going to the gym. So we're getting into activities, right? We're doing things and we're getting into activities that help us relax. Maybe that help us center our mental health and well-being is what I'm seeing. Caring for yourself physically and emotionally, doing things to maintain your mental, emotional, and physical well-being, promoting happiness and joy. I love that. I think it's Taquia. I love that. Self-care is doing stuff to promote your mental, your happiness and joy. Taking a moment, right, to reflect. Um, taking care of yourself in any way you can. So it encompasses all of these things. 
At our college, we tend to not really focus on self-care as much. We need to because we don't have the proper tools. I love it. I wanted to hear that because while self-care can be something that's promoted in other spaces, it could be novel or something that's not even really promoted where you are. And I love having that a part of the conversation because we're going to talk about it. Catering to yourself, defining my needs, defining my wants. Oh, Rashanti, you're on it. Kimberly, turning off my cell phone, Indisha, defining my needs, defining my wants. Y'all, these are all definitions of self-care. These are all activities that we can engage in to care for ourselves. When you close your eyes just for a moment and you think about self-care, and I'm going to invite you to even do that. If you were to close your eyes and would think about self-care for just one moment, what images pop up? What images pop up? Before I share my images, I really want to hear you, you all's images. What images pop up for you? Meditation. Okay, so you see yourself sitting there meditating. What images pop up when you think about self-care? I'm really curious. We have some really good practices. <laughs> Sleep. I love it. An island. Ooh, a beach. Sun. So it almost feels spa day. Yeah, yeah, relaxation, all of the things, all of the things. Let's really talk about, you're not wrong. Everybody's right. Everybody's right when we start thinking about what self-care is because it is a practice for you. Um, it is something that engages you. I'm with you, Anika. The gym, lifting weights. I want the heavy weights too. Roller skating, dancing, laughing, many petty, all of these things are awesome and they are phenomenal. But I think, I just believe that perhaps part of our definitions of self care may be missing a little bit of something. Okay. So when I looked up self care, you know, I've seen several definitions of self care and what average will say, um, role is misperceived. It's not spelled correctly, but it's okay. When we look at the different definitions, self-care is a practice of taking an active role and protecting your own, one's own well-being and happiness. Anisha said family, and that's the piece that I really want to talk about because self-care is not a solo job all the time, Okay. When we look at these traditional definitions, namely Oxford, I pulled the Oxford definition because I believe it was a really good combination of all kind of the definitions that you all have put out there. Self-care becomes a practice of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being and happiness, in particular during periods of stress. OK, so I have a few challenges with this definition. Just a few. It suggests that the pathway to happiness and well-being comes only through one's self. Right. And it's not without some truth. I do think there's truth. I think we should take ownership. We should go to the spa. We should go to the gym. We should live. We should be meditating. We should be in the sun. We should be doing turning our phone off. We should be sleeping. We should be doing all the things to take care of self. But I do believe that self-care is something that we do to take care of ourselves is being in community with other people. Right. When we think about how self-care to me is about thriving, it's not reactionary. You know, when you look at this definition, we, we, we see that self-care is usually something we do in a particular period of stress. And if I were to ask you for a moment to think about that, do are you engaging in self-care in response to stress, which would be more reactionary? Or are you engaging in self-care as a proactive measure to thrive? Right. I'm going to do this regardless. I'm going to go to the spa regardless. I'm going to go to the gym regardless. I'm going to journal regardless. I'm going to be with family regardless to take care of myself. Or are you engaging in these practices in response to stress, which feels kind of reactionary? So my challenge with the current definitions of self-care out there is that it suggests that the ways to being, I thought so, some people feel like it's response to stress. Some people feel like it's proactive. Some people feel like it's a good question. I want you to ponder it because usually when we're engaging in self-care, it's about in response to something not necessarily being, here's what I need to thrive. 
I am, like I said, I'm a licensed psychologist and my practice is dedicated to black women, namely black women who are leaders of their families, their communities, their companies, you know, they're in the, all of the, they're leading in multiple domains. And one of the things that I find often is that they are caring for themselves, you know, in the aftermath. It's something that they're tagging on. Um, they are, many of them are part of the first generation to be able to thrive. I want you to think about that. Many of their elders, their ancestors were a part of that survival group. They they didn't even think they didn't have the space, y'all, even think about caring for themselves. It was about survival. And so now these women are part of that group that get a chance to thrive. But you and your generation will, I believe, be the trailblazers for what it means to care for ourselves. And what I want you to take away, if you take away nothing else today, is how do I make that a part of my lifestyle? How do I become proactive about that and not reactionary to it? I'm not waiting until it gets bad, till I'm completely stressed out to be able to have these self-care practices. You are the generation that I think will lead that era of, you no, know, we deserve to be um well, we deserve to be happy and we deserve to engage in these practices. So I ask this question because this is the traditional definition based on Oxford Dictionary is, are you engaging in these practices in response to stress or is it a part of your lifestyle? Okay, so I say this because I believe that we should expand the definition. OK, I think that we should expand the definition of self-care. I fundamentally believe that we are hardwired for relationships. I believe that caring for yourself is not a solo job. I don't I do believe that there are certain things that we need to be able to know for ourselves, do for ourselves, care for ourselves. But I don't think it's a solo job. I believe that we are a collectivist as people. And I believe our best care comes from a community. We have a responsibility to build our community and work at cultivating the relationships that means the most to us. And when we find that relationship, when we find those, that community, that is when we will flourish and blossom And in terms of our care for ourselves. So I believe that, yes, self-care is all the things we talked about, going to the gym, meditating, journaling, taking a mental health day, turning off your your phone, sleeping, going to the spa. I believe self-care is all of those things. But I also believe that self-care should include having deep and meaningful relationships with ourselves um, and with ourselves and with others. So you're at a point in time right now where you are in what I call part of some of the best years of your life. Let, let's just call it spade a spade. You're in part of the, some of the best years of your lives because you're in a space where you have access to all these amazing people who you may or may not form relationships with. And it feels like it's the norm right now. It feels like I can go to the union. I can go to a game. I can go anywhere and run into people. And it feels very much so like it will always be your norm. But I'm here to tell you that at some point you're going to matriculate through your undergraduate experience. You're going to graduate from college and you're going to look back on all of the access you had to all these amazing people who I believe and we're going to talk about that for the second part of this presentation could have helped you develop strong, intimate, meaningful relationships. And you're going to wish you had have done it differently. Well, you're not going to wish that because you're here today, which means you're going to get the skills and you, the tools you need to do it differently. But you are in a space right now where I want to invite you to really take advantage of the access that you have to people who are going to be meaningful parts of your journey. Now, you ask for tools and resources and you're in a really good place because you're going to need tools and resources to really be able to connect with people and form intimate relationships to be able to take care of yourselves. Right. One of the things I hear consistently in my practice as a psychologist, people tell me all the time, oh, Dr. Hill, I really wish I would have done undergrad differently. I really wish I would not have relied on proximity. To people, right? I really wish I would have been intentional about cultivating these relationships. I really wish that I would have had more depth in my relationships. I really wish that I would have done things differently so that right now I could be benefiting from the fruits of these types of relationships. I hear this consistently, but you're not going to have that problem. 
You are not going to have that problem because you're going to understand the moment in time that you're in and you're going to be more intentional about cultivating relationships and being in community and caring for others who are in your community so that you will ultimately blossom in your mental health and well-being. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about more how do we expand this definition of self-care to include deep and meaningful relationships. Okay, so I know what you may be saying. All right, Dr. Hill, I hear you. All right, deep and meaningful relationships. Why is that important? Because it is. <laughs> relationships are important. Now, here's the reality, y'all. We all differ, you know, in our need, um, and I should say our capacity for being in relationships with other people. So that that's kind of like introversion, extroversion, you know, we can differ. Some of us need relationships to recharge. Some of us need to be recharged with our relationship with ourselves. So we differ in what we need in terms of how much I should say, excuse me, we need for relationships. But the reality of it is, y'all, is that we definitely need to be in social relationships. We need people to thrive because on your worst day, right? On your most difficult day, on your most challenging day, after you've done all those things, after you have meditated, after you've gone to the spa, after you've gone to the gym, after you've lifted heavy, what's the one thing you feel may be missing? You really want to share what you've gone through with someone who means something to you. And that could be platonic, that could be romantic, that could be with family, right? That could be with people you work with. But you really have to understand the importance of relationships in your journey of self-care. And I just want to take a moment to really talk about why they are so important, right? Yes, relationships definitely help us grow. So relationships teach us about ourselves. So I don't know if you all are familiar with Johara's window. If you're not, I want you to Google it. I'm going to even write it here in the chat because I think it's very important for you to uh, learn more about. It's called Johara's Window. And what Johara's Window teaches us is that it's just a framework to help us understand ourselves. So within this framework, there's these pains of awareness, right? In one pain, there is what I know about myself and what people know about me, right? What do I know about myself and what do people know about me? People know I'm wearing green, <laughs> right? It's, it's public knowledge at this point. People know that I'm my, I have locks, I know that I have locks. In the Jahara's window, it basically tells us these are things that are aware to us, but and they are aware to others. But here is why I think that relationships are so important because they teach us about ourselves. In that same window of awareness, you have things that are unaware to you, but are aware to others. And what we call that is our blind spots or our areas of growth. When you're in a relationship with people, they are able to share with you the things that are not aware that to you, but they are aware of. And guess what? It may be the critical piece that you need to take care of yourself. It may be the critical piece that you need for your mental health and well-being. I fundamentally believe that the answers to, you know, our lives, our journeys are locked up in our relationships with other people. And so when we are in not just surface relationships, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. When we are in deep meaningful relationships that is where we re really begin to flourish in our mental health and well-being because relationships are going to teach us about ourselves relationships are going to help us grow being in college i was in college at southern university which is in baton rouge louisiana so we had people from all over the globe we had people from atlanta from the west coast from the east coast from the midwest from the south i was able to really learn about all the different cultures within the black diaspora and learning about that, I was able to figure out, oh, this really works. I like this area of, I like what the, the Midwest is bringing. I really like what the East Coast is bringing to the table. I like what the South is bringing to the table. I was able to learn about myself, what my culture had abundance of, what my culture maybe have lacked, and then pick up and take in from other cultures only in relationships, y'all. You can't meditate that away. You can't. You can't learn that from being in the gym, lifting weights. You can't learn that from a retreat. You can't learn that being in the spa. Certain things about life that enrich our lives can only come from the context of relationships. They teach us about ourselves. They teach us about the world. They help us to grow. They show us what we value. 
What do I mean that by that? When people you're in relationship with value, let's just go back to our, our, our metaphor. Some people may value being physically active and some people don't. When you run up in run up in, against that in relationships, you start to believe, oh, well, that's really not my, that's not my stilo. You know, they like that. I don't like that. But the, but it gives you another piece of the puzzle to help you understand what's important for your mental health. So relationships will teach us what we value. Relationships are going to teach us what we don't appreciate. A hard truth is that not everybody you are in relationship with will have these traits that I feel are healthy, that will nourish you, that will help you grow, that will help you evolve, right? But it's still information and you will know that relationships are going to be our mirrors, right? We're going to run into somebody and we're going to like have the same things in common and we're going to be like, oh my God, I really appreciate this accent, this music. I appreciate your, your love for food. Relationships help. They unlock the key to our mental health and well-being in a way that self-care practices in and of themselves can't do. Relationships help us evolve. Relationships refuel us, right? When we're in deep, meaningful, intimate relationships, we're able to be refueled. We're able to feel renewed, feel rejoy, uh, rejoice. We're able to feel excited. If we don't feel that, then we may figure out, uh, maybe we need to reapproach the way we're doing this relationship thing. Maybe all of the self-care that I'm doing one-on-one is good, but it's not really refilling me. You know, it's not really helping me grow. It's not helping me evolve. It may be maintenance, right? The self-care practices that you use. It may be something that you're doing to help you respond to a stressful moment, whether it be, you know, competition, whether it be uh, competition in sports, whether it be academics, whether it be your next step, your transition out of undergrad to graduate school, these self-care practices may be helpful to help you survive, may be helpful to help you manage stress. But if you want to talk about thriving and you want to talk about your mental health and well-being, what we're really talking about is being in relationship with other people and really building our community. And we're at a space, you're at a space in time that's very unique where you have abundant access to that. And when you have abundant access to something, you can tend to take it for granted. You can feel like it's going to always be there, but I am here to let you know that it will not always be there. And it is at this moment in time, you're a very, a very critical moment in time where we want to learn how to take advantage of the people we have around us um, in a way that's meaningful for both people, not transactional in the sense of, oh, I'm just going to take advantage of you because you're here, but in a way that's going to be deep and meaningful that will teach us about ourselves, that will help us to grow, that will help us understand what we value, that will help us understand what we appreciate and help us evolve. Because when you really get to the core of mental health and well-being, it really is about the community and relationships we have that help us to thrive. So I want us to expand this definition of self-care to include the relationships that we're in. Now, I'm going to just keep it 100. I'm going to keep it 100 with y'all. We're living in a digital world, right? Which means we have a overabundance, I should say, access to people about what they want us to know about their lives. But that doesn't mean we have rich relationships with these people. So how many people can relate to that? How many people feel like, eh, yeah, you know, I, I got people that I'm following Dr. Hill on TikTok or IG or Facebook or what have you, but I still feel lonely. I still don't feel like I'm evolving. I still don't feel like I am growing. I still feel like something's missing. I don't have intimacy. Y'all don't got to tell me, but I know. I know it's true because I see it all the time. So let's talk about it. How many people feel like they have this access to people, but not this connection? to people, access to people, but not connection with people and therefore not intimacy with people. I'm really curious. I'm going to pause to just, I knew I could get some people to tell me, keep it 100 with me. And I'm not going to say any names because I know this is being recorded, but I want you to know that I see it in the chat, that you feel this way, that you feel like, okay, I have this uh, access to people, but I don't have the connection. And, you know, what I want to say to that is you're not by yourself. You are not by yourself. I tell people all the time, if my therapy walls could talk, they would say that you are amongst a lot of people who feel that way. Because I do believe that somewhere along the line, we forgot how to cultivate the skills that is needed to connect with people. 
the skills that is needed to understand what is a healthy relationship, what is not a healthy relationship. How do we really do the work? And you're right. Access does not equal connection at all. So when I talk about access, I'm talking about connection. I'm talking about meaningful relationships. The reason why you may feel this way is because the reality is that relationships and really to be able to cultivate them, they're challenging. They're challenging. You're really at a space and time where you're really learning how to cultivate these relationships, right? I, love, I see the comments. I'm just going to acknowledge I don't have enough connection or intimacy with people because I don't know how or when to connect. The pandemic contributed to the degrading of my relationships, right? We're going to talk about the different phases in a moment. They say it takes a village to raise a child and a community to raise an adult. you got to find your community. This is all true because we're in a space where we kind of got lazy, y'all. We kind of got lazy. We kind of took it for granted. We kind of felt like, uh, I can see you. I have access to you, but it's not the same as connection. So the reason why you may feel this way is because the reality is that relationships, the kind of relationships that I'm talking about, the kind of relationships that's going to help you thrive, it takes work. It really takes work. There are different phases, you know, of relationships. There's first the connection. Right. Most time we connect with people based on what I call surface things. Girl, you have some cute shoes or oh, that's a cute necklace. Oh, I like the color. That lipstick is cute. Or do you could really hoop. Bro, I'm really liking your locks. Man, you got a, a dope flow. Right. The connection is the easy part. Right. But then there is how do we develop the relationship? How do we cultivate what we call intimacy? Right. How do we cultivate vulnerability? Who do we be vulnerable with? Right. We're not going to be vulnerable with every person. Not every person has good intent, but not every person does not have good intent. So having these types of relationships take work, we have to connect, we have to cultivate, but then we have to maintain the relationship. Both of my best friends live in different states. One lives on the in Miami, Florida. One lives in Houston, Texas. I live in Los Angeles, California. But we have deep, meaningful relationships because we have both invested in the tools and the skills to be able to stay connected and maintain those relationships. And I think that this is your challenge of the hour to really understand, you know, how to develop the skills to to move beyond connection and really cultivate relationships. Right. To really I, I appreciate what you're saying. I feel as though people take your vulnerability for weakness. Right. People don't people can mishandle you in relationships. Right. People don't understand that vulnerability is the greatest strength that you can have. And that I assure you that 10 years from now, they're going to wish they had learned they had learned how to be vulnerable. But what I'm saying is that that's great. That is a good indicator that that's not the person for you at this point in time. Because relationships will require work and you understanding who is willing to connect, who wants to just get beyond the surface, who wants to have a deep and meaningful relationship. You know, how do I trust other people? What are some of the indicators that I should trust other people? Right. I really love what you all are saying in the chat because it's real. It is real challenges of the time. And I believe because you're here, you understand that in a way that other people don't understand it. So we're going to give you some tips and insights about how to navigate it. But I want to be very truthful and upfront. It's not easy. If every if relationships were easy, everybody would be in deep, meaningful relationships. Everybody's mental health and well-being would be flourishing. There would be no challenges. What the research consistently tells us is that if you are in meaningful, intimate, vulnerable relationships, it helps with anxiety rates. It helps reduce depression. It helps you cope with trauma. It helps you recover from burnout. Relationships are the cure. It's not the end all be all. It doesn't mean you don't need to have coping tools or some of your self-care practices, but relationships are a, a tool that is very critical for our mental health and well-being. But people don't understand how to do relationships all the time. And that's what I'm going to give y'all a little handbag, a handbag of tricks to help you out. OK, so the challenges of relationship is the one they take work and let's call a spade a spade. Not everything. What you see is what you get. Right. People like to perform. People like to put out the best versions of themselves. You know, people like to be invulnerable, right? People like to do all of these things. So what you see is not what you always can get. And, you know, let's just be honest. Doesn't that kind of like turn you off a little bit? 
turn you off a little bit. And I know some of the things that you say, you know what, see, that's why I can't be messing around with people. People too toxic. I need to cut them off. I'm not intimate, interested in being vulnerable. I'm not interested in being mishandled. You know, you are responding to some of the dysfunction and unhealthy traits that people have. It doesn't mean that you should stop looking. It doesn't mean that you should stop trying. It just means you have to be more thoughtful and more intentional about it, right? It just means that we have to develop the skills to do relationships well. We should never give up on people. We should never give up on relationships. At our core, we are collectivists. We are communal. We are not individualistic. I do believe that we're going to go farther, farther with other people than we can by ourselves. But we have to learn those skills and tools to be able to do that and look for healthy relationships. OK, so here are some of the skills. Get your pen, get your paper, get your phone, whatever you need. We're going to think about five skills I want you to be able to cultivate to have good relationships and ultimately find your community. OK, first, you got to know your needs. I, I use this metaphor often because I think it's so relevant. Right. So when we are kids you know, or babies, I should say, we cry about everything, right? We cry and sometimes that cry means we're hungry. And sometimes that cry means we're sleepy, right? Sometimes that cry means we wanna be picked up. Sometimes that cry means we wanna be held. Sometimes that cry means we don't want our caregiver, whether that be our mom, our dad, you know, our uh, nanny to go, Right. We begin to cry for everything because we start to understand, oh, I have a need and that need is not being met. I want to let you know that that particular way in which your body responds to your needs not being met follows you throughout adulthood. And your job is to figure out what those needs are. Your job is to figure out what those cues are. Right. When I feel cranky, when I feel irritable, when I feel upset, when I'm crying, what does that mean? Does it mean that I'm hungry? <laughs> does it mean that I'm sleepy? Does it mean that I need a hug? Does it mean that I need to be held? Does it mean that I want to be around people? Does it mean that I want to be around my family? In order to be in good, meaningful relationships, we have to understand our needs. Nobody tells you that. Nobody tells you that when you're in high school. Nobody tells you that when you're in grade school because parents and adults are so busy doing it for you. But when it comes to adulthood, your, your job now is to learn what it is that I need and begin to seek that in your relationships. Your job is to understand your boundaries. I see y'all going in in the chat about boundaries. Like it took me years in, in therapy to learn and set my boundaries. Family can be a trigger for our boundaries. You know, boundaries are a big deal. Boundaries tell us what is my limit? What am I not willing to do? And a reality of that is that it takes time and what I call trial and error to figure that out. Right. And when you're learning your boundaries, my tip to you is to pay attention to your body. Your body keeps the score. You know how it feels when you feel on edge, when something bothers you, when something lingers with you, when something doesn't sit right with you. It usually kind of means perhaps my boundaries have been crossed, but I don't know it. Right. My boundaries are being crossed all the time in these relationships, but I don't know it. I don't get it. And. You know, this is a new muscle that you're exercising. So you may not have the language. It may feel foreign to you. It may feel unfamiliar to you. And this is why I'm always encouraging you to seek therapy, to seek, uh, yeah, seek professional help to really help you understand what's going on for you. You know, maybe from a mentor. In, in my experience at Southern, most of my professors really served as mentors to me. They helped me understand my needs, helped me understand my boundaries. But ultimately, the work was on me because once I knew my needs and I knew my boundaries, now I can figure out what kind of relationships I need. Right. When you're your task of the hour is to learn how to cultivate these skills, to understand your needs, to understand your boundaries, to understand your voice. Right. What is my voice? My voice has power. My voice is me sharing what I like, what I don't like, what I appreciate, what I don't appreciate, what I'm what I'm scared of, what I'm excited about. Being in a relationship, you have to exercise your voice. You also have to show up as your authentic self. And I know, I know what you're going to say. Well, Dr. Hill, that's scary. And that may, that feels very vulnerable. Do it anyway. 
we have to show up as our authentic selves because guess what? I would much rather be in a relationship with someone who honors me in my authentic self than someone who wants a representative of me, who only wants a persona of me. Those aren't your people. The people you have to perform with, that you have to laugh when you want to cry with, the people that you can't be your authentic self, those are not your people. You want to practice showing up as your authentic self. And I'm going to be real. Sometimes that's going to be met with rejection. And that's okay. That's okay. I think rejection is redirection. So showing up as your authentic self is a skill for relationship. Because guess what? If I show up, if you haven't noticed, I'm pretty jovial. I could be funny. I could be humorous. And if you don't respect that and accept that, yes, that may hurt a little bit. And I may grieve that and I may have some anxiety about that. But it doesn't do anything but let me know you're not my people. Let me figure out who my people are. So these are the skills that I want you to practice as you are trying to cultivate these relationships with different people. Because remember, you're going to connect with them first, but you also want to be able to cultivate relationship with them. And then identifying what helps us grow, right? When you're feeling stretched, relationships should stretch you, y'all. It should feel home enough and comfortable enough that you don't have to perform, that you can use your voice, that you can get your needs met and under your boundaries, but it should stretch you. It should make you be curious. It should make you want to grow. It should challenge you. These are the skills that I want you to invest in as you leave here. You ask for tools, you ask for resources. I'm telling you, as a psychologist who specializes in focusing on relationships, emotional needs, um, and how to thrive, I am telling you, this is the rope, this is the blueprint right here. These are the five skills and tools that you need to be able to cultivate healthy relationships because that's going to be your key to thriving. So, Knowing that not all relationships are created equal. Okay. Not all relationships are created equal. And, you know, arguably you may or may not have all of these things present, but I will give you that there are four signs that you are in a healthy relationship. Four signs that you have healthy relationships around you. There's going to be a level of respect. There's going to be a regard for you, a regard for your wishes, your boundaries, who you are as a person, right? There's going to be reciprocity. There's going to be feeling like you are refilled as much as you're giving, feeling like you're supported as much as you support, feeling cared for in the way that you give care. That's reciprocity, right? It doesn't mean it's always 50-50 because sometimes if I've had, you know, my dad passed away in 2011, so I didn't have the most to give to my relationships, but because I had given so much, I was able to receive the care that I had always given. So reciprocity isn't always about, okay, 50-50 right now, but by and large, I am getting as much as I am getting. Healthy relationships should have joy. Are you laughing? Are you appreciating your time together? Are you feeling lighter? Are you feeling inspired? Are you feeling good? Or are you feeling depleted? Are you feeling degraded? Are you feeling less than, right? These are the signs that you look for to know, do you have a healthy relationship? And the fourth sign of a healthy relationship is growth. Are you growing? Are you evolving? Are you starting to see the world differently? You know, or do you feel like the worst part of you is coming out? The worst part of you is being activated. Knowing that relationships are very critical to our mental health and well-being and subsequently us thriving, we have to have make certain that we have healthy relationships. So I want you to just take a moment and think about the five people you spend the most time with. Right. Your your top five relationships. Who do you engage with the most? Send TikToks and IG, you know, memes to each other all day, you know, kick it with on the weekend, work out with. Who do you spend the most time with? Who are, what are your top five relationships? And write those down. Really think about that. And I want you to know, is, is, is these healthy aspects present? I want to know, rather. Is there respect? Is there reciprocity? Is there joy? Is there growth? And I want you to drop it in the comments for me. I want you to tell me if all these aspects are present, respect, reciprocity, joy, and growth, put 100% there, Dr. Hill. If it's only three of these, 75%. If it's only 
two of these, 50%. If there's only one of these, 25%. If there's nothing, zero. I need to start from scratch, right? So think about these top five relationships and I want you to reflect. Let's do a little bit of assessment. What's present? Is there respect present? Is there reciprocity present? Is there joy? Is there growth? Shout me out in the comments and let me know what's the state of our relationships. Because if relationships is an important part of our self-care and we don't have these aspects that are needed to have healthy relationships, we got to pivot. So what's present? Is respect present? Is reciprocity present? Is joy present? Is growth present? If it's not present, you know, I don't always believe it's all or nothing, right? If respect isn't present, then I'm throwing it away. <laughs> we got to start from scratch. But if reciprocity isn't present, we can teach each other. We can teach the people who are in relationships what we need, you know, what our boundaries are. Is joy present? Is growth present? It's not all or nothing, but I do think it's a good place to start to figure out what is the status of my relationships? Are they healthy? And as you're thinking about that, I wanted to serve, it, it should it should pause you for a second, right? It should really pause you to think about where's my time going and who am I pouring into? And as I'm pouring into these people, am I getting respect? Am I getting reciprocity? Am I getting joy? Am I getting growth? Because and as I said, all these amazing self-care practices that you all mentioned at the beginning are amazing and they're great. But when you're going through your most amazing moment in life, your most blissful moment in life or your most challenging moment in life, I assure you, you're going to want relationships and you're going to want to want healthy relationships that have these elements. So as you all are assessing and dropping those in the comments for me, I want you to think about a few things as we wrap up before we open up for questions. Think about what came up for you today. Like what resonated with you today? What came up? How has your definition of self-care been redefined? Right? And if there's anything that I said that made you make your light bulb go off what is it that you want to commit to i want to commit to being more intentional about finding my community i want to commit to learning my boundaries i want to commit to understanding my needs i want to commit to having relationships that have joy i want to commit to learning these skills dr hill because i've never heard of this before i need that i want to make that commitment i think a part the first step is to show up the second step is to be engaged. The third step is always action. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to make a commitment to today to make certain that our mental health and well-being, our self-care is first and foremost, but it's happening in the context of communal care. Now, I will say I threw a lot at you. So if you're feeling as though, OK, this was good. You know, Dr. Hill, I talk about these things all the time. Um, connect with me if you want a deeper dive. You can connect with me on Instagram, on LinkedIn, or YouTube. I'm always talking about uh, the importance of relationships, setting boundaries, emotional maturity. How do we thrive as a community? And I will be happy to either provide additional resources for you or direct you to people who can provide those resources to make certain that you are centering your mental health and well-being. All right, I will open it up for your questions. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. So Tamara asks, how do you how do you balance the need for relationships with the need to create boundaries with people who aren't good for us? She called them the haters, the gaslighters, <laughs> and people who would hold oh. you back. Okay, tomorrow. The category. Okay, <laughs> give it to me one more time. How do you balance the need for, for relationships with the need to create boundaries with people who aren't good for us? So those haters, those gaslighters, how do you balance that? 
Mm. So I would say haters, gaslighters, I don't necessarily know if we need to have boundaries or with them or we just don't need to be in relationship with them. So mm. I don't think that people who are hating, you know, everybody comes from different family units. And so they have different, I would say, capacities to be in healthy relationships. So for people who have maybe a little bit of unhealthy patterns, we may have to have boundaries with them because there's potential, right? But for people who are always gaslighting, gaslighting, always hating, I'm not certain that that is something that we should be invested in. And also the question asks about balance. I would say we don't ever give up the need and the pursuit of healthy relationships because we run into these gaslighters and haters along the way. That to me is the balance. You're kind of like filtering. You know, who's good for me? Who has respect? Who has reciprocity? Who has growth? Who has these good traits? Oop, I ran into it. I didn't run into it. You don't throw it away and say, I'm just not going to have relationships at all. But you don't linger with people who I think have what we call toxic traits, which is about gaslighting and being a hater. I think that's a completely different journey of engaging. Um, hmm. I also want to add, that importance of just having a voice and speaking up. Because maybe sometimes people don't know how the things that they're doing are impacting you. So you have to let mm -hmm. them know. So hopefully we are finding our voice in this relationship and saying, hey, this thing that you're doing doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And maybe they Can had no idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little more about that? Because I think um, for a lot of us, um, our parents, right? They told us to be quiet. So mm -hmm. I don't know how many mm -hmm. of you the chat we're told you know to be quiet only speak in a child's place and not realizing how that silenced our voices could you talk a little bit about like finding your voice because i think that was a powerful um message that you uh, you were talking about in terms of the skills and that resonated with a lot of our attendees so, so. yeah i think that your voice is your most powerful tool here's what i want to say about our parents i think and the ways in which we grew up and how it influences our voice. I think sometimes I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Our parents did the best that they could and even their best didn't center our mental health and well-being. Hmm. Right. So what do I mean by that? I grew up, my mom is probably a, uh, she's above the baby boomer. She's in her seventies. And so self-care, listening to my voice, honoring what I need, that's not a message that I got from her. In fact, I think that it was kind of stay in a child's place and be silent. But what you have to understand is even though that message came to us from them, it doesn't mean that it was the best message to serve us. So a piece of the puzzle is to understand that everything that we've gotten from our family doesn't mean it's always healthy I, or it's, it's, it's going to serve us in our best interest. I think that's always step one. I think that's always hard because we feel like our family is amazing. They know everything, everything they said, we're going to try it out. But when I say that the body keeps the score, I mean that your body doesn't feel good when you silence yourself, you know, whether it be I can't sleep at night. I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling on edge. I'm feeling irritable. Your body is letting you know something didn't sit right with me. So in that regard, I want you to give yourself permission to explore what that is, right? If something happened yesterday or two days ago and it's still lingering with me 48 hours later, that's my indication that it didn't sit right with me. I probably need to have a conversation. I probably need to bring it up. I may not have the perfect language, right? You may not know exactly what to say, but you can start with something simple of like, hey, Remember two days ago when such and such happened? Like that just didn't sit well with me. That is the beginning of you starting to practice using your mm -hmm. voice. And then when, you, when people are able to say, oh, yeah, let's have a conversation about that. Or, girl, you tripping. Then you're going to get an insight about can I use my voice in this relationship? So I think that that's a really good point you bring up because we don't come hardwired sometimes with that insight. But I want us to know that your body will keep the score. Barring any trauma that has like a fundamental reset, your body kind of lets you know, ooh, something didn't sit right with me. I don't like that. It's lingering with me. It's messing with me. I'm staying up at night about it. Your body's trying to get you to know that you need to say something about this. Mm, thank you. We've got some more questions. Oh, thank you, everyone. I love this. Um, <clears throat> how do you build a relationship with someone who tends to hold their emotions in? Ooh. I love this question. Okay, so a person who's holding their emotions in, 
is struggling with being vulnerable, right? The vulnerability is about expressing ourselves and allowing ourselves to be seen. And I think a very kind way to invite people into being more vulnerable is to make a note of what you've seen. Hey, I've noticed that you always kind of hold your emotions in. Like, what's going on for you? Like, I'm here for you. I, I want to know. I can support you in this. You have to sometimes give people permission to be vulnerable. Because remember, again, I, I started with this. Everybody hasn't been taught vulnerability. They haven't been taught how to name their emotions, express their emotions. They don't know what their needs are. You all are in a very interesting time. It's a lot going on and you don't have a lot of tools and language to figure it out. So it's a lot of chaos. So I think it's very important to have a lot of curiosity and take away these tools that we we learned and say, you know, I feel like you you can girl, you can express yourself with me. You can use some humor with it, you know, depending on how you how you how your personality is. But I would say invite people to be vulnerable. Sometimes they're waiting on permission. Hmm. Um, I want to say this. Um, in my practice, I always tell my clients to ask more questions and make less statements. Really just be curious, mm, ask true. people what's going yeah. on with them before you decide yeah. what's going on and make some statement about <laughs> that's not true about me. Ask me, ask more questions of your right. friends. I tell you, you get so much more out of people because people want to know that you care enough to ask them what's going on before you assume yeah. that they did you wrong for some reason or another. So yes, mm -hmm. I always tell right. people, ask more questions, make less statements. I love um, that. Oh, we have another good one. Um, we have another good one. How do you recommend that we make initial connections, especially if you're shy or an introvert? Um, this is for my introverts. If you can identify yourself, okay. you know, this is for you. Good question. <laughs> I say, okay, so this is why I tell, I have a lot of introverts in my practice, so I get it. I think I want you to not overthink it, Right. Go to a space that you like, you know, do you, I'm a sports head, so I love sports, right? Or do you like good food? Um, go to a place that has good, a restaurant or go to the, the union. And I want you to be out of your head and in your body. When you're in your body, you're able to truly connect with a person. So I may say I'm an introvert and I may be like, well, I like your haircut. Just pay attention to what you like about someone that genuinely connects you with them. I like your haircut. I like your smile. I like your energy. Oh, what you said was funny. So I would say start small. You may want to start in more of an intimate setting, but you want to just go to a space and connect with people in those moments, in that element. And of course, it's going to require a little bit of vulnerability. So you're going to have to share something. A fun story. My best friend now, who's been my best friend for over 12 years, what connected with us is that I loved her, the color of her hair. I was like, oh, your hair color is cute. And it introduced a whole conversation and now we're best buds. So something so small that connects you, don't discount that. Pay attention to that, lean into that and share that. And of course, maybe you won't be best friends in that moment, okay? But it could begin to make you more comfortable with trying to connect with people. One small connection at a time. Hmm. Um, Hello. So we're going to take one more, okay? So this Diamond is a asked... This is yeah, a doozy. It's not that easy to answer. <laughs> but good luck. Um, Dr. Hill, we're preparing you. How do you how do you not feel bad for cutting your family off because they are not here for your emotional, physical, or spiritual support? Ooh, baby, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay, so I would say <laughs> you don't you're Thank gonna you feel bad. Question. Yeah. You're going to feel bad. Give yourself permission to feel bad. I think so much, so often we want to control how we feel about things and we can't. We can manage how we feel, right? You know, and I can relate to that. I've, I've had my mom share with me, frankly, she's just not, she said, my life, your life scares me. So she can't show up for me. She can't be present for me. She can't do these things. And that pisses me off. It makes me angry and anger is a layered emotion. So it makes me sad. It makes me disappointed. You can't control how you feel about that. I guess my response to you would be you can get professional help to help you navigate that because now you're going to need tools and skills to navigate this journey. So that response, I think, requires professional help that I hope we've normalized. You know, I, I tell people there's two type of people in the world, people in therapy and people who need to be. Okay, there's only mm -hmm. two. 
people in therapy and people who need to be. So going on therapy and, and figure out the tools and the skills you need to navigate that because that's very complex. Mm, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. This is amazing. Let's give her her flowers in the chat, y'all. Thank Dr. Hill. Come on, give it up. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I had great you questions. Good job. Information in the speaker bios. As she said, she's on IG, Dr. Lawanda Hill. Um, this was amazing. We thank you so much for being present with us today. And I know that, you know, the attendees got a lot of it because I know I did too. And next we'll have I our second did. session, which is a fireside.